So I call that name Jesus. Call it on the behalf of the hand that I'm holding. Call that name for this hand's family. Jesus. Call that name for this hand's finances. Jesus. Call that name for this hand's children. Jesus. Call that name for this hand's parents. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I call that name for this family hand's relationships. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Call that name for this hand's healing. Ah, Jesus. Call that name for this hand's joy. Jesus, Jesus. Ah. Oh God, move. Call it, we call it, we call it, we call it. We call it, we call it for this hand's future. Jesus, make every crooked place straight, every, every high mountain low. And in the name of Jesus, there's power in your name. Healing, deliverance in, the, in your name. So now God, I pray that you would bless this hand with the word today I pray and this my weakest hour be my greatest source of power hide me behind the cross so much so that your people would see none of me but all of thee yet glory in this place we ask in that name Jesus Amen as you're still standing as you're still standing, I thank God for our pastors who are here and their families, Pastor Coleman and Brian and Robinson and their spouses. And I thank God for our sons and daughters and ministry leaders of our church, this awesome music ministry, ushers, you my heavenly father's children. There's a word from the Lord I want to share with you um, this morning. I'm continuing this series of sermonic presentations on a very challenging subject somewhat of an uncomfortable subject for some it is the issue of forgiveness two weeks ago we looked at Genesis chapter 50 and looked at how Joseph was able to forgive talked about just let it go last week if you were here we looked at Matthew 18 at the wicked servant who got it but couldn't give it Today, I want to look at an issue that keeps us from forgiving. It's the issue of anger. I want to preach on anger today. Some of us are still so mad that anger is hindering our anointing. The fact that we won't let it go. We're still holding on to stuff. We're holding on to grudges. And there's a word found in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Is verse 26 and 7. I want to read specifically from the Message Bible today. It'll be on the screens. If you don't have the Message Bible, you can look on the screen. It's a challenging word because when people do you wrong, when people hurt you. I had a young lady last week that says, I'm struggling because I'm mad at the person that killed my father. Got an email from a lady who still mad at the one who molested her as a child someone right now you're holding on to this hurt and God sent you here today to hear this word last week Sabrina Fulton Trayvon Martin's mother was in church and as difficult as it was she sent an email saying thank you pastor I needed to hear that word so God knows where you are and God knows who you are and God knows what you need to hear Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26 and 7 it says go ahead and be angry you do well to be angry but don't use your anger as fuel for revenge and don't stay angry in fact don't go to bed angry don't give the devil 
that kind of foothold in your life. Amen. Turn to your neighbor, look him or her in the eye and say, neighbor, neighbor. Don't, let don't let anger have the advantage. Amen. Amen. That's what I want to preach about today. Don't you let your anger have the advantage. It's, it's going to be all right. It's going to be, it's going to be all right. Don't let anger have the advantage. This, this afternoon, my brothers and sisters, our Samonic Spotlight, uh, it shines on a subject matter that all of us uh, in the building are familiar with, uh, and that subject matter is anger. Can the church shout anger? We're all familiar with anger because uh, by definition, anger is simply an emotional arousal caused when something or someone displeases us. And regardless of who we are, how long we've been saved, how erudite we are in scripture, what title we wear when we come to church, um, displeasure is something that all of us has and will continue to experience as long as God allows us to live on planet Earth. Therefore, anger in and of itself is not sinful. Uh, please hear what I just said. Anger in and of itself uh, is not sinful. What's sinful is what we allow anger um, to do to us, with us, and through us. Uh, for clarity, you got to get this. Anger is a natural emotion. Anger in and of itself, it's not sinful. Uh, what's sinful is what we allow that anger to do to us, with us, and through us. We know for a fact that anger is not sinful for the Bible says that God himself got angry. The Bible is clear in the book of Deuteronomy. If you're taking notes, Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 8. The Bible records Moses speaking to the children of Israel, saying, In Horeb ye provoked the Lord to wrath, so that the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 20, Moses said, the Lord was angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. And I prayed for Aaron also at the same time. Therefore, when we read the word of God, uh, the word of God proves that God, just like you and I, also get angry. In fact, there are several passages when you peruse the Old Testament, particularly in Numbers 25 and Jeremiah 4, well, you can read the phrase, the anger of the Lord. And every time that phrase, the anger of the Lord, is mentioned, it's specifically referring uh, to God's anger that brought, that was wrought against sin or oppression. Anytime there was sin or oppression in the Bible, God got angry. In fact, a good illustration of that uh, is Jesus Christ himself in Matthew chapter 21. Uh, don't go there. Read it when you get home. In Matthew 21, when Jesus uh, went into the temple and when Jesus saw people being oppressed in the temple, the Bible says Jesus got angry. Uh, he made a whip. I need a Bible reader here and turned over tables and kicked out uh, the money exchangers. Why? Because Jesus saw poor people being oppressed because anytime you see someone being oppressed or the presence of sin evident that's called to be angry can the church shout anger what's interesting about anger before I uh, get into the text is that when you read the Bible I, I thought it interesting that the Bible uh, speaks of how anger if you're not careful uh, can kindle someone shout kindle uh, Kindle, 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 Genesis chapter 30, um, verse number 2 says that Jacob's anger uh, kindled against Rachel. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, verse 15, uh, it says, For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, uh, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. That, that word kindle, please stay with me, that word kindle uh, in Genesis 30, verse 2, and Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, verse 15, uh, it connotes the thought of how anger, uh, like a pot of water sitting on the stove, can start off simmering. Uh, but if left unchecked, 
uh, that same water will uh, start doing more than simmering, but will turn into a boil and slowly spill over onto the stove. Uh, because anger, are y'all here this afternoon? Uh, because anger, if left unchecked, uh, it can grow to something that's out of control. Because I've discovered that there are different uh, stages of anger. Turn to your neighbor, tell them there are stages to anger. Uh, in fact, if you're taking notes, anger has at least three different stages. If you're writing this down, take notes. Uh, the first stage of anger is what I call uh, irritation. Someone shout irritation. Uh, irritation is the stage where you start uh, experiencing mild to mid-level annoyance. Uh, irritation is the stage where you warn the people uh, that they're getting on your last nerves. Uh, hello, somebody. That, uh, that irritation is anger's starting point. Uh, it is at this stage of anger that uh, you hadn't said anything yet. You hadn't done uh, anything yet. Hadn't thrown anything yet. Help me, God. Hadn't cut anybody yet. Uh, it is at this stage of, of anger you are reminding yourself and others. You got one more time um, to do this. Uh, uh, it is at this stage, this initial stage of, of anger that uh, you warn people. You got one more time to look at me that way. You got uh, one more time to step on my foot and act like you didn't do it. Even in church, you got one more time uh, to pretend like you shouting and hit me. Uh, amen. On, on the slide. Uh, uh, th that's anger's starting point. Someone shout an irritation. All of us, we've been at that initial stage of, of irritation, that uh, initial stage. At that point, anger only has a, an attitude. If anger is not checked in the initial stage called irritation, um, that anger begins to grow um, to the second stage of anger, uh, which is called indignation. Someone shout indignation. Uh, indignation is a dangerous stage of anger because it is at this stage uh, that your emotional threshold now has been crossed. Uh, it is at this stage, Carl, of anger uh, where tempers are lost, outbursts are uttered, and even confrontation uh, is made. Uh, it is at this stage, the indignation stage, uh, that normal behavior is deviated from. Uh, it is at this stage you find your yourself going off on folk. Uh, it is at this stage you start saying stuff you didn't think you knew how to say uh, anymore. It is at this stage where fingers are in folks' faces and heads are being waved and hands become on the, I wish I had a praying church. Uh, it, it is on this stage called uh, indignation. At this stage, anger um, does not have an attitude. At this stage, anger has uh, animosity. Uh, but if an anger is not checked in uh, irritation, if anger is not checked in indignation, then anger grows to the third stage, and that stage is called uh, incineration. Someone shout incineration. Uh, at this stage, help me Jesus, at this stage, your anger has given birth to rage. At this stage, your actions become uh, uncontrollable. Uh, at this stage, hello somebody, your inner Jasmine Sullivan come out and you grab that crowbar and you want to bust those windows out. Uh, help me God, the car. Uh, at this stage, you are a danger to yourself, your surroundings, even society. Uh, at this stage, folk make TV shows about you called Snapped. At this stage, you go postal. At this stage, you lose it. At this stage, you forget about the consequences of your actions. Uh, and anger no longer has an attitude. Anger no longer has animosity. But at this point, anger has uh, the advantage. Uh, and my brothers and sisters, uh, uh, if you're not not careful, uh, you can allow people uh, to take you there. Oh, I wish I can call the road. If you're not careful, you can allow your children, your parents, your baby mama, uh, your baby daddy. If you're not careful, uh, your husband, your wife, your employer, um, your employee, uh, your church member, your choir member, uh, your usher mate, your deacon, your deaconess. Uh, if you're not careful, you can allow people to take you to the place where 
anger has the advantage. Uh, Aristotle once said, uh, anybody can become angry. That's easy. Uh, but to be angry with the right person at the right degree, at the right time, for the right purpose, in the right way, uh, is not in everybody's power. Therefore, the question that must be asked and answered this morning is this. Uh, Pastor, how um, do I keep my anger from getting uh, the advantage? How can I conduct myself in such a way that even when I'm angry, my angry anger don't take control of my life. Pastor, how do I get to the point that I can be mad but sin not? How can I get to the point that people can get on my last nerve, try to get me to lose my job, try to get me to lose my joy, try to break up my relationship? How can I get to the point that people can despitefully use me, talk behind my back, smile in my face, dig ditches for me to fall in, but yet I still don't allow anger to get the advantage. Paul, he helps us in this narrative where Paul declares Eddie that if we're going to keep anger from getting the advantage, the first thing in verse 26 that we must not do is we must not let anger control our actions. Turn to somebody beside you and tell them, neighbor, don't let anger uh, control your actions. Uh, look at what the text says. The text says, all right, go ahead and be angry. Uh, you do well to be angry. Ang angry. He says, but don't use your anger as fruit to for revenge. King James Version says, be angry, um, but uh, sin uh, not. Tell somebody beside you, stay in control. Stay in control. Stay in control. Because when you read the Pauline and the epistles, if I can teach this morning, um, Pearl, the one thing you know about Paul uh, is that in Paul's writings, Paul was always concerned uh, with his listeners staying uh, in control. And we know that because when you read the Pauline in the epistles, Paul always talks about being uh, filled. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 3, um, verse 19, Paul told the church at Ephesus that his prayer for them was that they are filled with the fullness of God. Uh, have I got a praying church? Uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, um, Paul told the church not to be drunk with wine where it is excess, but but he told them to be filled with the Spirit. Uh, when Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, um, Sister Howard, Paul said that he was praying with them um, that they are filled with the knowledge uh, of God's will. Why? Because Paul knew that whatever you are filled with, you'll be subsequently controlled by. If you are filled with anger, you'll be controlled by anger. But if you are filled with the Spirit, help me God, you'll be controlled by the Spirit. Tell your neighbor, stay in control. And child of God, that's what the devil wants. The devil wants control over your life. I'm talking to somebody right now. Anytime and every time we allow anger to dominate our life, what we're doing, Alex, is that we're giving the adversary control over our actions, whether we admit it or not. And some of us got it bad because some of us are projecting stuff on the person in the present based on our pain in the past. Here here it is. You were hurt in the past and you've carried those hurt feelings into your new situation. And I'm here to tell you that if you want your anger not to get the advantage of your life, you cannot allow your anger to control your actions. Pastor, I know it's easier said than done. Well, Paul says if you're going to actually do this, there's three things between verses 17 and 25 that you got to know. Paul says in verse 17 that if your actions are going to stay in control, Paul in verse 17 says there must be a refusal to be similar. In verse 17, stay with me, Paul says this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as a other Gentiles. I wish you were reading your Bible. Paul says in verse 17 of chapter 4, Paul says that you can't walk like everybody else walk. Paul says there must be a refusal. Can I teach this morning? A refusal to be similar. Paul says that you can't act like everybody else act. I know this is not popular, but Paul suggests we can't even dress like everybody else dress. Why? Because God didn't call us to blend in, to fit in. God called us to stand out because he picked us out. Am I hearing somebody today? Paul suggests that if we're going to allow anger not to control our actions, we can't be like everybody else. Nudge somebody. Tell a neighbor, you got to be different. 
First Peter chapter 2. Can I preach this morning? First Peter chapter 2. Denise says uh, uh, that we are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. We are a peculiar. Someone shout peculiar. Peculiar means my walk is not like everybody else's walk. Preach pastor. My talk is not like everybody else's talk. Peculiar means my disposition is not like everybody else's disposition. Why? Because I have to act like the one who I'm representing. I I am an ambassador of Christ, which means I'm in the world, but not of the world, which means I got the same eyes, but I don't look like everybody else. I got the same hands, but I can't touch everything. Why? Because I got to act like the one who called me. I feel like preaching in this house. So Paul says, Jesse, please stay with me. So Paul says, number one, there must be a refusal to act similar. It ought to be something different about how, how you act. Have I got any help in this house? I shouldn't have to know what church you go to to know that there's something different about you. I don't have to know what denomination you are to know there's something different about you. It's something about how you carry yourself. How you keep your cool in the midst of chaotic times. How you walk upright when everybody else is walking any kind of way. How you speak life and speak scripture. It's something different about you. In fact, it's how you love a folk because you do know that by this all men will know who you are by what you do help me somebody it ought to be something different about the way you carry yourself because you are a child of God it's amazing to me how it always gets quiet when we start preaching about living a certain way uh, it's amazing when I preach about goodness and fortune and favor and riches and when I preach about cars and houses, uh, how we are tie up the church. And when I talk about living a certain way and dressing a certain way and walking a certain way, when I talk about abstaining from certain stuff, y'all look at me like I done lost my mind. But oh, holiness without shall no man see the Lord. There must come a time in our walk with God. We must deny the flesh. Paul says we got to act different. Can I go a little bit farther? Pa pa Paul says, watch this in verse 17. Paul says in verse 17, there must be a refusal um, to be similar. But then in verse 22, Paul says, secondly, there must be a removal of self. Paul says in verse 22, um, that ye put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt. I wish I had a reader right there. Paul says that we put off concerning the former conversation of the old man which is corrupt. Somebody shout the old man. What is Paul talking about the old man? Paul uh, is talking about the old you before you got saved. Paul is talking about that unredeemed you. Come look this way because you do know there's two yous inside of you. There's the you now and the you then. And if the wrong person catch you at the wrong time, the wrong you will show up. <laughs> Have I got any help in this house? That's why you better be careful who you mess with because you, you might mess with the wrong you. Help me somebody. You better be careful uh, how you fool with folk and how you lie on people and how you talk about people because you might catch the wrong you on the wrong day. Paul says uh, you can't let the old you show up. In fact, nudge somebody beside you and tell a neighbor, let the old you stay down. You know the old you, that old you that would cuss somebody out, uh, that old you that would go, come on somebody, that would put Vaseline on your face and put your hair in the ponytail. Uh, Paul says don't let that old you come out because God died that the old you may stay dead. And Paul says, if your anger is not going to get the advantage, that old Mike can't come back. Let old Candy stay dead and don't let old Darrell come up. Keep old Derek dying. Keep old Calvin dead. Keep old Johnny dead. Keep old Cheryl down. God knows keep old Bernard down. D don't let the old man. I'm trying. Pa Paul, 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 say with me. Paul says, I'm in verse, I'm in verse 17 through 23. Paul says, if, if, if my anger is not going to get the advantage, he says, number one, I, I, there must be a refusal to be similar. I can't walk as other Gentiles 
walk, even if it's lawful. Because everything that's lawful is not expedient. I wish y'all let me teach. I know you're grown, but even grown folk ought to govern themselves. Because the worst thing you can do is cause somebody else to stumble watching you. Y'all ain't hearing me in this house. Pa Paul says there must be a refusal to be similar. Paul says there must be a removal of self. But then look in verse 23. Then he says there must be a renewal of the spirit. He, he says and be renewed. Help me God. In the spirit of your mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul said there must be a renewal. Someone shout a renewal. A renewal. That, that, that I, I can't stay in control. Operating in my own spirit. I, I, I need the power of the Holy Ghost. I, I wish I was talking to somebody over here. Who, who need the power of the Holy Ghost. B because if you know like I know the Holy Ghost will keep you. I wish I had a praying church. I, I can't tell you how many times I wanted to do to somebody what they done to me, but the Holy Ghost. Harness me. I wish I, I guess I'll try this. I can't tell you how many times I wanted to go blow the blow with somebody, but the Holy Ghost wouldn't still let me. I, I, I can't tell you. I, I guess I'll talk to the back. I can't tell you how many times I wanted to cuss somebody who cussed me, and, and I didn't do it, not because I didn't know the cuss word, but the Holy Ghost held my tongue. Am I talking to somebody in this house? In fact, you got some co-workers right now who ought to give the Holy Ghost some praise, because if it wasn't for the Holy Ghost, help me God. Am I talking to somebody in this house uh, who can give God crazy praise? praise because the Holy Ghost kept you out of jail. The Holy Ghost kept you on your job because if it wasn't for the power of the Holy Ghost, you would have lost your mind. Paul says. Do I have any help in this house? So, so, so Paul says, Paul says, watch this, Paul says, uh, if my anger uh, is not going to get the advantage. Number one, Paul says, uh, I got to control my actions. Turn to two people beside the neighbor. I'm um, stay in control. Stay. Come on, tell the neighbor. Tell the neighbor, stay in control. That's what the devil wants. The devil wants to make you lose control. The devil want to make you lose your temper, lose your mind. The devil want to make you act like you're not saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. But I would that you just tell your neighbor, the neighbor, stay in control. Oh, but look at the text, because secondly, the text suggests to us that if we're going to keep anger from getting the advantage, not only must we not allow our anger to cause us to lose control, the Bible then secondly suggests that our anger can't continue always. This is the part of the sermon where it gets quiet. The text says our anger, number one, can't control our actions. But then, secondly, the text says, and don't stay angry. Yes. Wow. Yes. Um, some married couple, the text says, and don't go to bed. Yes. Y'all don't put your head down. <laughs> I, I know this is, this is a hard word. But Paul says... Watch this. No matter how hurt you are, no matter how mad you are, no matter how angry you become, Glenn, there must be a stature of limitations put on your anger, which means you can't keep hating the one that hurt you. You can't stay mad at the one that maligned you. You can't keep despising the one that dogged you. You can't keep ridiculing the one that wronged you. You can't keep chastising the one that cheated on you. You can't keep paying back the person that pained you. At some point, term limits, there must be some term limits placed on your anger. At some point, you got to let it go. At some point, there must be a stature of limitations placed on your anger. How long are you going to hold on to the hurt? Somebody done turned me off. This, this, this is what Paul is saying in the text. I'm almost done. Paul is saying, don't let the sun 
go down. I wish y'all were reading the Bible. Don't, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. I, I know I'm talking to someone who's saying, Pastor Jackson, this is a hard word. I don't know how I can do this. And Paul teaches us. Paul says, well, first of all, you need to understand that when you are angry, you can't follow your passion. You must follow the pattern. Someone shout the pattern, the pattern. When, when you're mad, you can't follow your passion because your passion want to do the, to, do the person what the person has done to you. Your, your passion want to retaliate. Your passion want to get in revenge. Your passion want to hurt back. Your, your passion wants to stab those who stab you. Your passion, you want to throw a rock, Calvin, who threw a rock at you. Uh, your, your passion want to get them before they get you. But Paul says, watch this, Kishore, you're not following your passion. You are following uh, the pattern. Someone shout the pattern. Well, Pastor, well, what is the pattern? Well, the pattern is found in Hebrews chapter 12 and um, verse number 2 uh, because the the writer of Hebrews says we ought to look unto Jesus. I wish I had a praying church uh, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus Christ is our pattern. Someone shout, he's the pattern. If he's the pattern and if when I'm angry I can't follow my passion but follow my pattern, then the question becomes how long does the Lord, <laughs> preach pastor, stay mad at us? If he's the pattern, and if you are suggesting when I'm angry, look unto Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of my faith, then the question then becomes, how long does the Lord Stay angry at us. Well, there, there, there's, a verse, there, there's a verse in the Bible. It's in Psalm, in the King James Version, in Psalm 30, uh, verse 5. And, and most of us, without even go, knowing the whole verse, uh, we know the B clause of verse 5 because we always quote it at funerals. Uh, it says, weeping endure uh, for a night. Oh, but joy. We like quoting that part. Weeping endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Well, I thank God for the B clause, but look at the A clause of the verse. Uh, because the A clause of the verse says, uh, uh, His anger uh, endureth but for a moment in His favor uh, is life. That tells us that every time God gets mad at us, every time God gets an attitude at us, uh, every time we do stuff to break God's heart, every time we do stuff that God tells us not to do and we leave under done stuff God told us to do. God gets mad at us, but the text says uh, he don't hold grudges. The text says uh, he don't keep his anger very long. The text says uh, his anger only lasts but for a moment. I'm talking to somebody right now who owe God some crazy praise uh, because by your own admission uh, God should still be mad at you. I'm talking to somebody right now. You owe God some praise. Can you just be real? You owe God some praise right now because as treacherous as you have been, uh, as the young folks say, as ratchet as you have been, you ought to thank God that God is still on speaking terms with your behind. You ought to give God praise right now that God still loves you as bad as you've been. Oh, okay, maybe that didn't get you. Um, 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 if he's, watch this, uh, if he uh, is our pattern, Watch this. Uh, if he's our, our, our pattern, and, and I'm suggesting that, uh, number one, um, he doesn't stay mad very long because the text says, Stacy, um, that his madness is only but for a moment, then the question then becomes now uh, is, what are the master's mannerisms uh, when his moment of madness has passed? Well, uh, Lamentations chapter 3 uh, helps us out with that one because when you read Lamentations chapter 3, um, verse 22, uh, it says this. It says uh, um, that it is of the Lord's mercy. Mercies, um, that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thou faithfulness. You ain't read what I just said. The text says the Lord's mercies. That's why we're still here because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Tap your neighbors and neighbor every morning. 
Well, put the two verses together, and this is what it says, Gene. It says, number one, that when we mess up, his anger lasts only but for a moment. And on the next morning, after his anger is over, he puts us on the wake-up list and gives us new mercies every day. And if you can't shout over that, you ought to give God crazy praise. Because guess what? On yesterday, you made him mad. But early this morning, he touched you with a finger of love and gave you some brand new mercy. And I'm talking to somebody right now who ought to give God crazy praise because God has wiped your slate clean. Can you turn to your neighbor, give him high five and tell him neighbor this praise is because God has wiped my slate clean. This praise is for the new mercy I got this morning. This praise is because even though I messed up on yesterday, he put me on the wake up list today. This praise is even though I've done wrong in my life hadn't dotted every eye, hadn't crossed every T. This praise is because early this morning, he touched me. My eyes came open. I had clothes to wear, a car to drive, food to eat, a roof over my head. I praise God for new mercies. Praise him for your mercy. Come on, praise him for his mercy. Praise him for his goodness. Now wait, now wait, here it is. Well, if you made him mad and he still gave you mercy, why can't you give mercy to somebody else? If God ain't holding the grudge, why are you still holding the grudge? If God ain't mad at you, why are you still mad at somebody else? If God has forgiven you, why are you having forgiven somebody else? I came to talk to somebody in this house because every time you refuse to let, I see you in the back, every time you refuse to let it go, what you're doing is telling God, God, I'm taking your grace for granted, but I came to talk to somebody in this house who know he's been too good to you to hold on to a grudge. He's been too kind to you to still be mad. He's been too merciful to you to still hold a grudge against somebody else. So do me a favor, tell somebody, neighbor, just let it go, let it go, let it go. Just let it go. Why? Because if you're not careful, Anger control our actions. If you're not careful, anger will continue always. But if you're not careful, that anger will carry you to the adversary. You didn't hear what I just said. Eddie, I said that anger could control your actions. I said that anger will continue always. But then that anger will carry you to the adversary. Paul said in the text, don't be mad always. Don't give the devil that kind of foothold in your life. Ten minutes, I'm done. Pa pa Paul says, to us, anger is like an automobile that's pre-programmed to carry us to the adversary, which is the devil. Paul in this text makes a correlation between our anger and the devil's advancement. Paul says when we are angry and our anger is out of control, what we do is we give the devil a foothold in our life. I'm going to kill a devil today. He is suggesting that whenever we refuse to forgive and hold grudges, no matter how we try to close the door on the devil, the devil always get his foot in the door. One of our members is a master mechanic. I had a chance to talk to our member the other day. He was telling me about this job, and, 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 I, and I gotta be honest, I hope he's not here. I gotta be honest, I, I really wasn't paying attention. I gotta be, are you, bro, are you here? Okay, good. I, I wasn't paying attention. He was telling me about all the, the hydraulics involved in the elevator, telling me about the size of the door and the force 
of the door. And I really wasn't interested in what he was saying. I was acting like I said, really, dog? Really? Really? No. Seriously? Get out of here. But, but, he, but he said something, Sister Coleman. He, he says that every elevator has what's called a Janus edge or a detector edge built in that when that door is closing, if a person put their foot in the door, that Janus edge hit the door, hit the foot, and that door automatically opens back up. I said, wait a minute, what'd you say? He, he says, Pastor, he says every elevator door has either a detector edge or a Janus edge. And when the door is closing, no, no matter how strong the door is, when that foot is in the door and that black strip called the Janus edge hit that person's foot, the door opens back up. So all a person really needs to do is to get in the elevator and just have their foot in the door. Y'all, you, you miss what I'm trying to say. I, I, I'll try it again for the slow people. He, he says, Pastor, I, I don't care if you have pushed your, no, your floor, uh, you own the door, or you, you're in the elevator, and you're trying to keep people out. Uh, all, he said, all a person got to do is uh, walk up to the door while the door is still open uh, and not get their whole body in the door, but if they just get their foot in the door, uh, the door will all automatically open and based on a foot in the door that person will have access into the whole elevator come here let me talk to somebody that's what the devil is trying to do to you the devil is not trying to come in all at once he's more subtle than that all the devil is trying to do is get his foot in your marriage get his foot in your relationship get his foot in your union all the devil is trying to do is get his foot in the door that's why it's so hard for you to forgive that's that's why it's so hard for you to move on. That's why it's so hard for you to just let it go. Because the devil got his foot in the door. And you're saying, Pastor Jackson, I don't want his foot in the door. Well, if you don't want the devil's foot in the door, all you have to do is just learn how to forgive. Learn how to move on. I know I ain't talking to everybody, but I came to talk to somebody in this house who's made up in your mind that God has been too good to you for you to spend the rest of your life. I guess I'll go for it now that you to spend the rest of your life uh, refusing to forgive uh, God has been too good to somebody uh, for you to spend the rest of your life uh, holding on the hurt uh, holding on the pain uh, I came to talk to somebody God has been too good to you uh, for you to spend the rest of your life uh, holding on to the abuse uh, I know you were hurt uh, I know you were damaged uh, I know you were lied on uh, I know you were molested uh, I know you were I know you were cheated on. I know you were criticized. I called everything except the child of the king. I know, I know, I know, I know. People talked about you, said you wouldn't be anything. But everything that you went through, it built your character. It built your strength. It built your stamina. Taught you how to pray. Taught you how to praise. Taught you how to worship. Taught you how to take a licking and keep on ticking. It taught you how to persevere. It taught you how to hold your head up, stick your shoulders back. I don't know who I'm talking to, but turn to your neighbor and look your neighbor in the face and say, neighbor, I know you've been through heartache, but tell them, neighbor, just let it go. Refuse to allow anger uh, to have the advantage uh, have I got a witness here uh, and just because uh, you don't know uh, who you're sitting beside uh, turn uh, to your neighbor and look your neighbor in the face uh, and say neighbor uh, I release you uh, to forgive uh, come on tell a neighbor uh, I release you uh, to let it go uh, say neighbor uh, I release you uh, to let the anger refuse to continue I release you to have joy I release you to have love 
I release you to have long suffering. I release you. I guess I feel like preaching. I release you to give God a praise. I release you to give God a Shabbat. I release you to stand on your feet and declare the pain is over. The hurt is over. The abuse is over. No more tears. No more sorrow. No more sad. And if I got a witness, if I give your neighbor a high five and say, neighbor, it's over. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know who I'm talking to, but it's over. Oh, yeah. Every person who's been suffering from chronic anger, meet me at the altar. Come on. You're still mad. Come on. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come on, baby. Come quickly. Come on, bro. Come quickly. Come on. Come. Come, 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 come. Come, come, come. Come, come on. Press your way. Come on. Come on. Come, come, come. Come on. Come on. Come on, come, come, come quickly. Come, move, 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 move. Move, 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 move.